So uh, let's get started, everyone. So uh, good day, everyone. So my name is Senor Costa Jr. and I work for the CGR program on climate change, agriculture and food security, the CCAFs. And I would like to welcome you to the third webinar series, uh, uh, third special webinar, special session of the 2020 Cliff Grads webinar series. So today's session will be on livestock MRV and our special guest is uh, Andreas Wilkes. Uh, Andreas is an associate expert at Unique Forestry and Land Use. And uh, Andreas has a, a training in anthropology and economics and has worked in natural resources management in Africa and Asia for more than 20 years with a focus on rangeland management and livestock. So Andreas has a uh, uh, in-depth knowledge in, of uh, in-country process relating to NDCs, GAG inventories, and MRV under the UNFCCC context. So I'm pretty sure you're going to have a great talk today and a very uh, valuable interaction with Andreas. So before we uh, get started and I pass the floor to Andreas, I would like to give you a few instru instructions on how we are going to handle uh, the, the, the webinar today. So Andreas will be giving a presentation of about one hour, 15 minutes to an hour. You can type down questions to Andreas using the chat box on the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen here and uh, using the q and I'm sorry, questions to Andreas, use the Q&A please, and interactions with your colleagues and with us as well as comments, please use the chat box, okay? Uh, and then, uh, I, before I pass the floor to Andreas, I would like to thank you so much, Andreas, for being here. Uh, it's, it's great, it's a pleasure to, 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 to have you here and to hear from you. And uh, without further, further ado, I pass the floor to you, Andreas, please. Thank you very much, Sinira. Um, Let me just uh, operate, uh, get some slides on, on share here. Can you tell me if you can uh, see this? Yes. Yeah. OK, so apologies that the format of modern day uh, communication is that people look at a PowerPoint and there's a head in the corner that moves, uh, which can be sometimes quite, quite tiring. Um, but I, I'm just learning this technology and I hope to be able to find more uh, interactive ways uh, to to, disc uh, to discuss and, and interact with people as, as we go along. Um, as Shiniro mentioned, uh, I've been working in livestock and rangeland management uh, for a number of years and in the last um, five years or so most of my work has been on uh, greenhouse gas inventories. Um, which is what I'm going to talk about today. There are lots of other aspects of measurement, reporting and verification uh, of greenhouse gases, but I, I'm going to focus on the inventory part. Um, that's partly because uh, a week or two ago, there was a, a very good presentation and discussion with uh, Olia Glade, and um, she went very systematically through uh, introducing the whole uh, setup uh, related to greenhouse gas inventories from the international level through to national level um, and, and describe all the, the requirements uh, in detail. What I'm going to do today is based on our experience in Kenya and Ethiopia, uh, where we've been working with partners to uh, develop national greenhouse gas inventories, I'm going to share some of the more practical experiences of how some of this happens um, in, in, in practice. Um, the work I'm going to talk about has been supported in Kenya by uh, GRA and in Ethiopia by CCAFs. Um, in both countries we've also had partnerships with the, uh, the World Bank, FAO and of course na national uh, partners. Um, and as Siniro mentioned, I, I'm working for uh, unique Forestry and Land Use, which is a consulting company based in Freiburg in uh, Germany. 
but operating uh, worldwide uh, with a focus, uh, or part of our focus on forestry and part on uh, climate change and agriculture and land use in, in particular. Uh, so what I want to do first, just give some overview of some of the key issues related to greenhouse gas inventories in, in the livestock sector. That's more from an international point of view and uh, the basics of the UNFCCC requirements. And then give some examples of what we did, why we did it that way and how we did it in Kenya and in Ethiopia. And then summarize a few key messages particularly uh, related to how research can link with ongoing improvement of uh, these uh, greenhouse gas uh, inventories in, in the livestock sector. So whilst I'm going to be talking about livestock, I think the general uh, gist of what I'm talking about is, is relevant to other um, inventories of, of greenhouse gases from cropland, grassland and, and other aspects as well. But the examples will be on livestock uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So why is there such a focus on livestock uh, in inventories? Livestock are a major source of greenhouse gas emissions in many developing countries. So I think uh, the UN generally counts uh, close to 200 uh, developing countries. Half of them, so 92 countries, have uh, included livestock emissions in the scope of their first NDCs. And many countries are currently updating their NDCs. And from what I can see, the number will uh, increase as knowledge and pol uh, policy attention to livestock emissions uh, increases. One of the challenges though, is that most countries are using the basic IPCC tier one approach to quantify livestock emissions. Only 21 of uh, the developing countries use a tier two approach, which is more useful for reflecting the effects of change in the structure of the livestock sector over time or change in management or productivity over time. And that linkage turns out to be quite key because with, uh, in the context of NDCs, on the one hand, countries mostly want to continue to develop their livestock sector. On the other hand, to track uh, emissions using their greenhouse gas inventory. So a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about is related to introducing uh, experiences with introducing uh, the tier two approach in livestock um, inventories. So for those of you who are not into this topic in particular, a brief introduction of the, why does it matter if it's tier one or tier two? So the way the IPCC guidelines work is Livestock emissions, and this is particularly talking about enteric fermentation and uh, manure methane uh, management, but in, in general, the livestock emissions is calculated by multiplying the activity data by an emission factor. In the livestock sector, the activity data is the number of animals, and the emission factor is emissions per animal. And the IPCC gives very practical guidance. The number of animals you can quantify by species or general categories, for example, beef cattle as, a, uh, as opposed to dairy cattle, sheep, goats, poultry. And then the emission factors, which you look up in the IPCC guidelines, are fixed per animal. So it's emissions of uh, methane per animal per year. And it doesn't change over time and it's the same emission factor for different production systems. Um, the 2019 refinement to the 2006 IPCC guidelines has improved this a little bit by giving different emission factors for um, the uh, high productivity systems and low productivity systems. But 
in general, that's the approach, which is very practical. However, it may not meet all of the policy needs that policymakers are becoming aware of with uh, in the new context of the Paris Agreement and having uh, nationally determined contributions to N NDCs. So the tier two approach is more useful for that. The tier two approach is calculated slightly differently. You've got the number of animals, but you get a more detailed classification of animals. So instead of, for example, total number of dairy cattle in the country, you can break dairy cattle into cows, heifers, bulls, calves, or other uh, detailed uh, subcategories of animal. And then the emission factor is estimated by uh, estimating the gross energy intake per animal and then multiplying that by the methane conversion factor, which is gross energy intake, um, uh, sorry, methane emissions per unit of gross energy intake. Now, the intake per animal in particular, this changes over time as breeds change or management changes or animal performance, for example, milk yields or uh, cattle growth rates um, as they change over time. So this becomes much more relevant if a country, for example, has a policy where they want to increase the productivity of livestock and at the same time uh, track and manage the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So this is why the tier two approach is much more useful in this kind of a policy context. But the challenge is that quantifying the numbers of animals in a more detailed classification and quantifying the performance of animals requires more data. So how can this be done in developing countries that perhaps haven't had decades and decades of uh, consistent, uh, large-scale, uh, well-funded research on, on these kind of topics like you typically find in, in, in developed countries. So I will be introducing the specific, uh, you know, how we deal with this challenge in a moment, just to cover a couple of other aspects of the, uh, the general overview. So in terms of the IPCC guidelines, there are six, uh, sorry, five main emission sources directly from livestock. Enteric fermentation, which is most commonly the main one, Manure management, which is both methane and direct nitrous oxide emissions. But then you also have indirect nitrous oxide emissions from manure management. And then some of the dung and urine is uh, deposited on pasture, range or paddock. And the direct and indirect nitrous oxide emissions should be calculated separately. So these uh, emission categories they are the categories that countries need to report, um, uh, use for, for reporting of emissions. How this should be done, the IPCC has provided a number of principles that were introduced by Olia a week or two ago in the last webinar. Um, the first is transparency. The way an inventory calculates the emissions, it should be transparently documented and clearly explained so that other parties who are reviewing it can, can understand and, if necessary, reconstruct the, the uh, estimates that were made. Uh, a second principle is consistency. So the same methodologies should be used over time so that if you're tracking the change in emissions from the 1990s until today, any change in the estimate is due to changes in the sector, not due to changes in methodology. And uh, the third principle is comparability. So the IPCC methodologies and reporting formats should be used so that the results between different countries can be compared. And the inventory should be complete. So all of the emission sources from all of the animals in the country should be uh, estimated if possible. And the final one is accuracy. 
which is stated as there should be no systematic over or underestimation of uh, emissions and uncertainties should be reduced as practical. So in many contexts, it's hard to be, to obtain the data required to be really sure that emission estimates in inventories are accurate, but at least they should not be biased. And then quantifying the uncertainty is very useful for addressing any possible uh, lack of accuracy in the, due to the data sources or, or methods that we use. When we come to the more practical aspect of inventories, there's a couple of other considerations. They're not listed as principles in the IPCC, but they do actually refer uh, in IPCC or UNFCCC documents do refer to these considerations at different points. The first is everyone knows that there's limited resources, finance and human resources available for making inventories. So we have to prioritize where those resources are, are targeted in order to make cost effective use of resources. And more recently, with countries submitting nationally determined contributions and some countries moving forward with actually implementing mitigation actions in the livestock sector, there's a question of compatibility. That the methodologies that you use in, in the national inventory ideally should be compatible with the methodologies used to track uh, emission re emissions in relation to the, um, the the NDC. I'll come back to that in the example of, of Kenya. So with Kenya, what did we do? Firstly, who's the we? So this, uh, this work has been uh, conducted in partnership with the State Department for Livestock of the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisher Livestock and Fisheries of uh, Kenya. Um, and support was provided both by GRA and by FAO at uh, different points in developing uh, this inventory. Uh, CCAFs has also been implementing a lot of research on mitigation in the dairy sector, which has informed um, the, the compilation of, of this inventory. So we produced an inventory for the dairy sector that estimated emissions from 1995 until 2017. Why did we do that? Well, firstly, I'll come back in a minute to why the dairy sector, dairy cattle emissions was the priority for Kenya. But in terms of why we selected this time frame, uh, Kenya's national inventory uses 1995 as the base year. And when you first adopt a tier two method in the inventory, you have to apply that method to all years so that you have a consistent time series in the inventory. You can't, for example, use a tier one approach until 2015 and then use a tier two approach um, in subsequent years because then uh, it would be more the change in methods which determine the, the trend in, in estimated emissions. So we faced a number of challenges. I mean, one is obtaining recent reliable data to make these emissions, but then the other is how do you reconstruct a plausible uh, time series back to the 1990s. Um, what we found, as you can see from this chart, which shows the enteric fermentation emissions, uh, the tier two emission, uh, tier two method led to a slightly higher estimate of emissions than uh, the tier one method. And the two methods are slightly diverging more and more over time. And that's due to the tier two method picking up the change in productivity in the sector, which the tier one method doesn't reflect. Just in terms of other overall results, so enteric fermentation was estimated to be about 85% of the emissions in, in uh, the dairy sector or from, from dairy cattle, um, with 8% from manure management, methane emissions and other sources contributing much smaller emissions. So enteric fermentation is uh, the main uh, focus. So why did we do this? 
So Kenya, like other countries, they've been preparing national communications every four years, which includes a greenhouse gas inventory. And in Kenya, to date, the livestock inventory in the national communication has been made using the tier one method. They've also submitted a nationally determined contribution. And when they made the greenhouse gas emission projections and estimated uh, emission targets for the sector, they used the national inventory, which also had a tier one method. But Kenya has also proposed a nationally appropriate mitigation action in the dairy sector. Um, in brief, this is an investment of about 250 million US dollars targeting about 15% of dairy cattle in the country, where they propose to reduce greenhouse gas emissions whilst increasing the productivity in the dairy sector. And it's proposed to use the tier two method to capture the effects of productivity change in, in the dairy NAMA. So this brings about the question of compatibility. How could Kenya, for example, be reporting emission reductions from the dairy NAMA calculated using a tier two method, but then the national inventory doesn't show any change in emissions? Or similarly, if they have, would decide to update the tier two, invent, uh, update the national inventory to a tier two method for consistency, then you would have inconsistency with the nationally determined contribution. So beginning first with moving the national inventory to tier two is seen as the first step in making a unified MRV system uh, for initially the dairy sector, but then it's also under consideration over time to move this to other subsectors in, in the livestock sector. So coming back to the, the, the dairy NAMA, this nationally appropriate mitigation action, the idea behind this is based on, on this sort of concept that, that I, I'm showing in the chart here. The chart shows that as you increase milk yield per farm, the greenhouse gas emission intensity, so CO2 per unit of milk, decreases. So this chart comes from a large scale survey that we did in central Kenya. Um, and it shows quite clearly that, especially at the lower end of the milk yield scale, that small increments in milk yield, small improvements in milk yield can lead to significant reductions in the greenhouse gas emission intensity. So the idea of the dairy NAMA is that if you can support farmers to increase milk yield, gradually they're moving towards the right hand side of this chart and emission intensity is decreasing. And there's a couple of different general strategies for doing this. So the first could be to intensify production. So in general, the stall fed animals or animals that uh, are, are in semi stall fed uh, feeding systems more productive than those in extensive grazing systems. So one could be gradually over time to intensify the production by changing the, the feeding systems. The other, within any system, whether it's stall fed, mixed or grazing, any other action or intervention that increases productivity, it also can reduce the emission intensity of uh, milk production. So, for example, using improved breeds, improving feeding, improving animal health, and so on and so forth. So, what does this mean for the national inventory? It means that in terms of the structure of the inventory, ideally, a tier two inventory could reflect changes both in the production system and the productivity of each system. So, this is what we worked out through discussion with the State Department of Livestock when we were talking about what, what do we need this inventory to be able to achieve? What kind of uh, utility, you know, how can we make sure the, the inventory is actually useful for the policy purposes um, that Kenya has? So how did we do this? I'll come back to, this is the tier two chart. Uh, 
talk about how we dealt with the issue of the number of animals, and I'll talk about how we estimated parameters that drive intake per unit of animal. So in Kenya, the Ministry of Agriculture, every year it obtains from the 47 counties of Kenya, it obtain, uh, obtains a report of the number of animals. This is reported through the ministry's uh, reporting systems. It's called administrative data. So it's different from official statistical data. It's different from research data. It's, uh, some of you are familiar with administrative data as a, as a, a type of data source. So in, in Kenya, the count, each county reports the total population of dairy cattle per county. But there's no data reported on what kind of production system they're in. And there's no data on the herd structure. So what percentage of the cow, cattle are cows, what percentage are bulls or calves or other, other categories. So we decided since the ministry has this data set from the 1960s all the way to, to present, we'd use the ministry's estimate of the total national population as the only consistent long-term data source that was available. To estimate the proportion of cattle in different production systems, we used expert judgment. So experts in the ministry who've been working in the dairy sector for, for a decade or more. Um, and what we did was we asked them to estimate for each county, which is the dominant feeding system. Is a county dominated by stall feeding or by grazing or by uh, a mixture of, of the two? And so the 47 counties were each allocated to a different production system. And then within each production system, we used published literature on the herd structure to estimate the population that is cows, bulls, heifers, and, and other subcategories. So just to show you what we came up with, this was the list of counties by an intensive production system, semi-intensive or extensive. Um, and based, having allocated the counties to each of those production systems, we were then able to estimate the proportion of total cat dairy cattle population in each production system. So uh, you can see over time that the semi-intensive system has the highest proportion, but there has been an increase in uh, cattle in the extensive system in the early 2000s. And basically, uh, otherwise, the intensive system has remained a, a relatively constant proportion around a third of the dairy cattle in Kenya. So this may not be totally accurate because it's based on taking each county as, uh, as a unit to estimate um, which uh, in uh, the proportion of cattle in different systems. But it was a practical method using the best available information at the time. Obviously, if we could do a, a nationwide representative sample survey, that would be better. But at the moment, there's no resources to, to be doing that. I'll come back to that later talk when I talk about improvements in, in the measurement. So in the ministry, apart from collecting the total livestock population data, they also estimate that about 55% of dairy cattle are cows. And they do this for the purpose of national accounting. So when the country estimates the contribution of livestock to GDP, it's based on these kind of assumptions. We have the total population, let's assume 55% are cows, and let's assume each cow has a milk yield of about 1,800 liters per year. So with our method, we actually came up with something a little bit different from the national accounts and, and the ministry's uh, conventional assumptions. What we did, was to take the intensive, semi-intensive, and extensive system, and we identified five subcategories of dairy cattle. Cows, heifers, bulls, growing males, and calves, which includes both male and female calves. And we used the literature on the herd structure to estimate 
the proportion of each of these subcategories in each production system. So we came up with an estimate based on the literature that uh, in the intensive system, about 43% of cattle are cows, and in the semi-intensive system, about 35%, which is quite a lot lower than in the ministry's conventional assumptions. So inevitably, our inventory would make a lower estimate of total milk output than the ministry in its official data, because we estimate a lower proportion of cows and actually a lower proportion of cows in milk uh, during the year. So, you know, this raises some issues. How can a country uh, issue inventory estimates that are not consistent with other official estimates like the, the national accounts? So we had some discussions around this, but we felt that since our approach is based on a thorough review of the scientific literature, it was more defensible than using the technical coefficients that the ministry uses. If there was no literature, though, we could have used those coefficients at least to produce an initial estimate. On animal performance, I'm just going to talk, there's a lot of aspects of animal performance in the um, IPCC model for uh, enteric fermentation. I'm just going to talk about two aspects. One is live weight and the other is milk yield. Live weight I mentioned because it is the major parameter that drives the net energy used for maintenance of, uh, of animals. And therefore, it, it's important, um, an important factor in determining the, the emission factor. Milk yield, I'm going to talk about because that is of particular interest to the policymakers in Kenya. They hope that the inventory can track change in milk yield. So the challenge we face is that there is no official or otherwise annual data set on either live weight or milk yield. And the reason for that is that in the ministry when, and each county when they collect, uh, when they report data on milk production, they use these standard coefficients like uh, 18, an assumption of 1800 liters of milk yield per year. So there's no actual tracking of change in milk yield. We were able to come up though with one survey in the intensive production system that estimated the live weight and milk yield of different breeds and two surveys in the semi-intensive region that also were able to estimate the live weight and the milk yield of different breeds, including really usefully one survey that had used almost the same method from 2000 to 2014 to collect the same data. So that was really useful in establishing the time series uh, for, for the inventory. And what we decided to do, we decided to use breed. So the, the proportion of animals, uh, cattle of different breeds as a proxy for both live weight and milk yield. So here's an example. There was uh, a survey in the intensive region in 1998 that found that about 72% of the cattle were either Frisian or Ayrshire, which are typically larger breeds with both, uh, both larger and with higher milk yields. And we found other data for 2008 and 2018, which also was able to report the proportion of different breeds. And based on the weighted average, we were then estimating a change in live weight from about 356 20 years ago to about 366. That's about, I think, a 0.5% change in live weight per year, which when we consulted some experts, they thought that's plausible, given that many dairy farmers in Kenya have been actively uh, working on uh, on the breeding aspect um, of uh, of their dairy production. So that's an example of how we use the proxy uh, dairy breed to estimate a trend in live weight. We did the same for milk yield per cow. So the dotted line there at about uh, 4.9 liters per cow per day, that's the standard coefficient used by the ministry. And the green line is the time series that was estimated using breed as a proxy for live weight. So 
our estimate shows that milk yield is still quite low, so it's still uh, less than five and a half liters per cow per day on, on average, but it has been increasing over time, which makes sense. Dairy farmers in Kenya have been investing a lot into improving their feeding, animal health, breeding. Why would they be doing this if there'd been no increase in milk yield over the last 20, 25 years? So again, it may or may not be accurate. It's difficult to assess given the methods that we uh, used, but uh, it, we could say it's uh, an estimate made on the best available information. Given that there's a lot of uncertainties, both in the allocation of uh, numbers of cattle to different production systems and the characterization of animal performance, we found that uncertainty analysis was absolutely critical in guiding us in the future how, you know, what do we need to focus on to prepare, uh, to improve the inventory? So this chart comes from our uncertainty analysis. We implemented this in a software called At Risk, which is a, uh, it's a link in to Excel. So it, it doesn't require any programming and so on. It, it can work in an Excel environment. And it runs Monte Carlo uncertainty analysis and then um, this, uh, it regresses uh, each of the input parameters against the overall uncertainty of the enteric fermentation emissions. And it can tell you which factor is more important in driving the uncertainty. So if I look, uh, for example, here up at the top, the proportion of cattle in 2017 in the semi-intensive system is the most significant factor driving uncertainty. Um, then the next is the proportion of cows followed by the feed digestibility, so digestible energy of feed um, for cows. So cows in particular, um, even more sensitive than other categories such as heifer, which is the seventh one down in the list. Um, and we also find that live weight uh, of cows also is a very sensitive parameter. So, so from this kind of analysis, even though we know that the inventory we compiled used, uh, let's say, second best data sources and methods, uh, this uncertainty analysis is really useful for highlighting where do we need to focus for future inventory improvement. And Interestingly, uh, there's basically two categories. One is the activity data. Uh, if the ministry can improve its ability to estimate uh, the proportion of cattle that are in different feeding systems or the, proportion, the, the herd structure, then this will greatly uh, improve the accuracy of, of the inventory. And the other aspect that comes out very prominently is uh, feed digestibility, so um, which is a combination of, of the feed composition and then the chemical composition of of the feed, and uh, so that's another area where future improvements um, should should focus. Uh, how can we collect that data? Well, since completing the inventory, we've had several rounds of discussion both with the, the ministry and with other development partners. For example, there are two large-scale World Bank projects in Kenya, both of which have a considerable focus on dairy. Together, they cover every county in the country. And there is an option or an opportunity through those projects to do some one-off large-scale surveys where perhaps we can better characterize uh, herd structure, but also better characterize uh, feed composition uh, through, through surveys. The other aspect that um, we're looking into is how to improve the administrative statistics. So at the moment, at the county level, each livestock officer, they use all sorts of different methods to estimate um, livestock populations and, and productivity, depending on their own situation. So how could we standardize 
the, uh, the collection of data at the county level and reporting to the national level. So it's too expensive to have a representative sample survey in each county, but could we use some other kind of a, a sampling method? For example, if each livestock officer in each county, let's say annually, they do some very detailed measurements on five households, and then the data is not representative at the county level, but perhaps representative at the production system level. So, for example, if um, at the sub-county level there are cattle that are being monitored on a year-in, year-out basis um, spread throughout the counties, but then the data would be able to be aggregated to estimate annual milk yield um, in the different production systems. So this is a, a concept that we're working on. Obviously, COVID has uh, got in the way of, of us proceeding with, with this uh, design. But that's an example of one way in which the inventory has been useful for pinpointing not only what data is needed for a better inventory, but also how it can help improve the national statistics. So briefly, I also want to just introduce some of our experience in Ethiopia where we've been doing something similar, but not just dairy cattle, we've been focusing on um, all cattle, sheep and goats. So we've also estimated from 1994 to 2017, um, a, a greenhouse gas inventory. This is working together with uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, as well as their um, uh, greenhouse gas inventory experts in the Ethiopian um, Forestry and Climate Change uh, Commission. Um, in addition to estimating the, uh, the trend in emissions over time, we've also looked at what's happening to emission intensity. So here in, in this chart, on the right hand side, that uh, scale there, it shows that emission intensity of milk production from dairy and other cattle in the country has gradually been decreasing in recent years. It's decreased from about 7.6 to more or less just under 7 uh, kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of, of milk. Um, so emission intensity has been reducing. And based on the change compared to 2011, you can calculate emission reductions due to that. And the reason we do that for Ethiopia, and we didn't particularly focus on that in Kenya, is that Ethiopia has its climate resilient green economy strategy, where they have already proposed a number of initiatives that they want to promote. Um, this is part of the national strategy. It's been mainstreamed into their medium term national development plan. And it's also the basis for their national, nationally determined contribution. So they have four main initiatives that they're promoting. First is improving uh, value chain efficiency. So anything in the cattle uh, value chains that will increase productivity, whether it's through feeding, health, marketing, or other interventions. They also want to increase the proportion of meat supplied by poultry and other lower emitting animals, such as small ruminants. They're promoting mechanization to substitute for oxen and measures to improve uh, rangeland management. So what we're hoping here is that the greenhouse gas inventory, if it's able to reflect the effects of some of these interventions, it could become the main tool used to track progress towards the green economy strategy and the country's NDC. How do we do it? Well, here's on the institutional side. This is a setup a bit similar to what we had in Kenya, but I'll, I'll, I'll introduce the example from uh, Ethiopia. So formally what used to happen is that the Environment, Forestry and Climate Change Commission, it would hire consultants to compile the livestock inventory, which would be reviewed by their Afolu inventory working group and then taken into the inventory. What's happened now is that the Ministry of Agriculture has taken on the responsibility for compiling the inventory. It then established two groups. One is a core team 
consisting of their own staff, a national consultant, uh, and also the greenhouse gas inventory officer from the Climate Change Commission, supported by consultants from Unique. And basically this group uh, compiles the inventory. Then we have an advisory group, which consists of uh, representatives from other uh, important agencies such as the Central Statistics Agency, the Ethiopian Institute for Agricultural Research, and, and so on, um, as well as some other development partners such as FAO and, and World Bank who are also uh, closely engaged on, on this topic. So the advisory group is used to consult, uh, to make inputs to inventory compilation, to review the inventory. Uh, then when the core team's finished with the compilation, it's submitted by the Minister of Agriculture to uh, the Ofolu Inventory Working Group. So that's the institutional setup that uh, we've used. Um, the review has been completed and we're just waiting for a final validation workshop, which ideally will happen in the next month or, or so. So how did we do it in terms of some of the more technical aspects? We divided cattle into dual purpose cattle and dairy cattle. For dual purpose cattle, there are two main production systems, mixed crop life, livestock farming systems and the pastoral or agro-pastoral system. And also dairy cattle, we identified two different production systems. One is a smallholder dairy, the other a more commercial and also the urban, peri-urban um, production is included in what we term the, the commercial dairy sector. And in each production system, we identified the, uh, six categories, cows, adult males, growing males, growing females, and two categories of calves, which are the categories that are available in the national statistical data. So our, the inventory categories are consistent with the national statistical categories. Uh, we also had two other subcategories, um, uh, smallholder animals, uh, male cattle, adult males that are um, finished in smallholder and commercial feedlots. What we found though is we had some missing data. So firstly, the, the Central Statistics Agency in, in Ethiopia, it has a very good annual sample survey of smallholder rural farms, but it doesn't sample commercial farms. So there was no official data on either the population in uh, commercial dairy farms or in commercial feedlots. And then I've also uh, ringed the pastoral, agro-pastoral uh, production system um, because of uh, various challenges to collecting data in some regions of uh, Somali region and Afar region of uh, Ethiopia. Um, there the statistical data is not complete for those regions. So we had to use alternative data sources and methods to fill in, uh, to estimate the populations of cattle in these production systems and their change over time. In terms of productivity data, as I mentioned, uh, Central Statistics Agency in Ethiopia has a really good data set on uh, rural smallholder uh, production systems. And we were able to use official statistics uh, as the estimate for some parameters such as milk yield, the percentage of cattle giving birth, um, even for feed digestibility. For other parameters, we basically did a, a literature review. For example, for live weight, we came up with, I can't remember, I think 30 or 40 uh, publications on the live weight of, of different uh, animals, uh, animal subcategories, and we then analyzed that data to estimate the live weight, uh, weight gain, um, and, and some of the other parameters used in, in the inventory. For other uh, inputs into the calculations, we used the IPCC default values because there was no uh, better available data in Ethiopia. But that's, that's fine. That's also, you know, a lot of developing countries when they first moved to tier two, uh, developed countries, sorry, when they first used tier two, they also adopted IPCC default values and, and improved from there onwards. 
I just want to talk about some of the improvements that we're now discussing with the Ministry and with Central Statistics Agency. This is how the Central Statistics Agency collects data on feed composition um, or diet composition. This is the table from the annual sample survey. They have six categories of feed type and you can see in uh, column four they ask each household did you use this feed type or not and then if they did what percentage of total feed is uh, contributed by each of these six feed types now it's a very simple method it's actually the method that is recommended by fao in the world census for agriculture but for an inventory purpose it's not ideal, let's say. So what we had to do with this data to estimate the digestibility of feed from grazing, we used literature values on the metabolizable energy from uh, pasture in, in the country. For crop residues, we had to estimate which crop type is it? Is it teff? Is it maize? Is it barley? We estimated that from the official data on crop output. For improved feed, we made a simple assumption that it's alfalfa, which is one of the most common improved uh, fodders used in, in the country. And for hay, again, it could be different varieties of hay which have different feed digestibilities. We assumed mm -hmm. it's simply the average feed digestibility of, of haze in the national database. So some simplifying assumptions were needed to transfer to, to translate this available data into something that could be used in the inventory. Now we're talking with Central Statistics Agency. We're actually soon to be implementing some pilots to look at some how can this be improved within their annual sample survey. So basically we're testing different uh, survey tools to see what difference would it make to the estimate of feed digestibility if we collected the data separately for wet and dry seasons or in, if instead of using six broad categories we uh, asked the farmers to name the specific feed type and also we're testing whether it, uh, it's feasible, cost effective and uh, more accurate to ask not just what type of animal, uh, what type of feed do you feed to your animals, but to ask for specific types of animal, because cows typically, if they're lactating, they're fed slightly differently from other animals or calves, likewise. So there's a number of improvements that can be made. Um, and we're working on uh, how the Ministry of Agriculture and the statistical agency can make these improvements. Um, we're also supporting them in developing a sampling frame for how they could uh, obtain data on the population of cattle in commercial feedlots and uh, dairy system. So that's some of our experience. And um, I just want to finish with a few, a few uh, summary points from my perspective. I'm sure you all have a lot of other takeaways uh, from this. I mean, the first thing is that uh, when making these inventories, we always start from what is the information that the user needs. So if the ministry has a, uh, a livestock development program where it intends to bring about certain types of change, for example, change in productivity or change in feed or change in manure management practice, then we need to design an inventory that can provide that information. So we always start from thinking, what does the user need from this inventory um, to make sure that it, it's really useful and uh, therefore the, the ministries and other stakeholders have incentive to invest in the continual improvement. A lot of the parameters in both the Kenya and the Ethiopia example, we estimated on the basis of uh, published literature and we weren't able to use all of the publications that we found because of some time, I mean, obviously the, the, the surveys and analysis and, and the writing of the papers wasn't done with the inventory in mind, but it's useful to bear in mind that if 
if you're doing research on something related and you hope that it can be taken up into the inventory, um, there are a few things that might make this more, uh, more possible. I mean, the first is that if the units and definitions in your study are aligned with the units and definitions used in the inventory, that's really useful. For example, if in Kenya, uh, we define cows as in the inventory as three years and above and heifers as one to three years, it's really useful if surveys can use those um, definitions of animal subcategories so that uh, when new data on cows and heifers becomes available, it can be used in the inventory. Um, another is that the, some of the most useful studies are those that are representative, statistically representative at the regional or production system uh, level. There's a lot of very small scale studies, a village here, um, a, a township there, um, and we have ended up using that data, but the, the most useful ones are those that are statistically representative at a, at a much larger scale. And also to use reliable data collection uh, methods. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, one of the challenges is we actually don't know the relative accuracy of different data collection methods. Um, a particular challenge being that once you do representative surveys at, at the regional level, it tends to be questionnaire based. And we have no idea how accurate or inaccurate farmer self-report of milk yields or, or feedstuffs are. So um, that's one aspect to pay attention to. Um, the other is that, you know, if things like sample size, standard errors of, of the means estimated and so on, methods used, uh, if these can be transparently reported, then um, it's useful for the inventory and peer reviewed uh, papers are obviously there. Um, preferred, but in Ethiopia we did end up using some master's theses um, that were um, in other respects up, up to standard. So the, some points to bear in mind if you're doing some research that's relevant to an inventory, um, you know, what, what might increase the, the chance of, of uptake. Um, and as I, as I just mentioned, and one of the key topics that is vastly under research is under research is, is what are the data collection methods that are most cost effective? So on the one hand, there's this question of accuracy. Um, for example, there was a study uh, uh, published a couple of years ago from Kenya where they had compared different methods for estimating milk yields um, in terms of their relative accuracy. And it, it turns out they estimated that commonly used questionnaire-based methods have an uncertainty of plus or minus, can't remember, somewhere between 20 and, and 30%. And it's really useful to know the, the relative accuracy of these methods. That doesn't mean that for inventory purposes, we should only use the, the gold standard best uh, most accurate method, because often these are also quite expensive and uh, difficult to implement on a large scale. For example, everyone knows that electronic scales are more accurate than using heart girth measurements on, on cattle, but it's also quite difficult to lug a electronic scales around the countryside and actually weigh a large number of animals. So studies that can actually quantify the uncertainty of these sort of second best data collection methods in comparison to um, the, the, the best methods are very useful for um, not only for uh, guiding what kind of methods can be most cost effective in the future, but also understanding the uncertainty of some of the existing literature reports. So that's a particular area that, um, you know, I, I, I hope that um, Cliff grads, CCAS and GRA can, can pay a bit of attention to. You know, we tend mostly to uh, focus on doing some research to quantify a particular parameter and publish uh, about that parameter, but actually a better understanding of the research methods used would be very useful um, for not only for inventories, but probably for the, the wider research community. So, a lot of the methods that I've mentioned for inventory compilation, they're described in 
a publication that GRA, FAO and CCAFS came out with um, earlier this year, um, Livestock Activity Data Guidance. So the purpose of the paper here is that, you know, often in developing countries, they say, oh, we'd like to use a tier two approach, but we don't have the data. Well, this guide, it basically focuses on how to really assess what data you do have and if there are data gaps in terms of missing data or poor quality data, how can you fill those gaps? Once you've made that first step towards the tier two inventory, then continual improvement is always uh, possible. So thank you very much. Um, there's a lot of other information also on this website, um, agmrv.org. Um, and I hope I will be able to take some of your questions if Shinero can guide me into how to do that best. Sure. Thank you so much, Andreas. This great presentation, of course, lots of learnings and, and takeaways. Uh, thank you again. So uh, we have a few questions uh, for you. Um, and let's start off with a question from uh, Solomon. Uh, from e Ethiopia, I guess, and his question is, given your uh, experience, Andreas, what is the best approach to uh, improve both productivity uh, of livestock uh, and what is the best approach to improve productivity of livestock and mitigate greenhouse gas? Um, as, I, as I mentioned, or as Sinero mentioned at the beginning, I'm an anthropologist and economist, so uh, please do also defer to your livestock scientists' uh, colleagues. Uh, I mean, it, it really depends. I, I, there's one key thing is whatever it is that mitigates greenhouse gas, it has to work for the farmers or livestock keepers. Yeah, it has to be um, Give, have positive incentives and benefits for them. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to happen or it's going to happen at some kind of a, a cost, put imposing some uh, opportunity costs on, on producers. Um, more specifically, uh, I mean, in, in general, you look at the literature, look around at, at what development, livestock development projects are investing in. It's a combination of things. There's, there's breed, there's feed. Uh, particularly important is animal health. So if Solomon, when you asked that question, you were asking what is the number one thing that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, I'd go with animal health. Um, because, I mean, if you look at like FAO's estimate of food loss and food waste globally, if you look closely inside, it's not about milk uh, falling on the ground or so on. 30% of global food loss and food waste is, is due to animal mortality. Um, so, you know, I, I put my money there. Um, and I think GRA actually has a working group that is really focusing on that because there's such a gap between the theoretical potential and the science. Um, but in other respects, look around, see what farmers are doing, see what the private sector is investing in, see what NGO and donor projects are investing in. These are the things that uh, are most likely to increase productivity whilst actually bringing benefits to livestock keepers. Thanks, Andreas. Now on the live weight of um, some cattle categories. So how uh, did you or do you estimate uh, live weight of a given category? Like you use the live weight, the mean live weight of each category for estimating emissions? That's a question from um, Bruno Alves. We did several things. So, uh, Data sources were quite diverse. If I can find a way to go back in, in, in the presentation to, to that relevant, um, one of the relevant slides there, there we are. So um, the surveys on which this were based, they, we used the literature when we compiled the inventory. And the literature themselves, they used heart girth measurements. So um, you put a tape around the chest of, of the animal and then you use a conversion equation, an allometric equation to convert centimeters into uh, kilograms. And um, so we use the reported results from these uh, studies. 
when we, the 2018 data point actually came from a survey that we did ourselves. And yes, we, we used the average of all animals in the cow category. So females that had previously calved that were three years and above. And we used the average um, of that. Interestingly, that you should ask about average, um, the distribution was not, it was not normally distributed. So we had to convert um, the, uh, transform the distribution of the original data into something that approximated the normal distribution before estimating what the, the mean was. Um, so there are a lot of sort of technical issues to do with how you estimate the mean, but anything that's the, a good estimate of central tendency within a particular age category group, um, I would say that would be what you, what you take. Thanks, Andreas. Now, uh, on the uncertainties, I'm compiling two questions, one from uh, Lucia Mindu and another for, uh, from uh, Nina. So, uh, could you please repeat the name of the two you used for estimating uncertainties? And uh, on top of it, uh, Nina understood that you used an Excel program called At Risk uh, for uh, accessing uncertainties. If that's correct, uh, is it open source? Can you share uh, the link of it? So please uh, comment a bit more on the uncertainties, Andreas. Um, yeah, so the, the tool is called At Risk. If I can find somewhere to type the answer in here, um, I can show you how it's actually written, which is not, um, it's, it's, it's this. It's, uh, so I don't know if you can see that on your screen. Um, it's, it's called At Risk. It's a commercially available software. Um, uh, it's not cheap. It's not open access. Um, I used it because personally, my own programming skills and so on are quite limited. And it's very useful because it's, it's just a plug into Excel. If you can do Monte Carlo analysis using um, other open access and commonly available softwares like you know the, the R software environment, then then that's equally acceptable and please do. I personally I, I lack the capacity to, to do that. Um, and I'm sure in addition to at risk there are other available softwares as, as well. Great. So Andreas, can you type it uh, in in the chat box please? Yeah. When you have a chance. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, and uh, another question from uh, Betel uh, Shefin is on uh, the APCC guidelines. So uh, can the, the methods and the full data of the APCC guidelines be used in estimation of emissions and removals at scale other than national? So if I'm uh, understanding correctly, it's the, basically at project level and national level, perhaps that's the, the way I, I got it. Yeah, so at project level, um, you have various uh, methodologies uh, that have been published by different organizations or that have been used by scientists. Um, you have official methodologies issued by carbon standards, like the clean development mechanism and so on, all of them promote uh, consistency with the IPCC guidelines. So in terms of um, what greenhouse gas emissions sources or sinks are included, what method is used to quantify them, what are, you know, and, and the principles that quantification must adhere to, that standard across all these quantification methods from project through to uh, national level. Where you find the, there becomes a difference is that um, there may be a difference in the, the kind of preferred or eligible data sources and the allowable range of uncertainty. Um, but the IPCC guidelines are generally standard to be used at, at different scales. Great. Thanks, Andreas. And on your work uh, with milk production in Kenya, so Titi's uh, Abdini is, uh, is saying, looking back at the graph, 
graph uh, that presents emissions intensity and in milk production per farm in Kenya, the range of uh, intensity is quite large. So why does this uh, happen? Uh, does it mean that farm with higher emissions intensity has less productivity, productivity counts? Uh, it's a combination. So if you, if you notice at, at the bottom of this chart, it says milk yield per farm, not milk yield per cow. Now the, the, the relation, if, if it was milk yield per cow, actually in the Kenya case, the relationship is even stronger than at, at the farm level. Um, that is to say, at the individual cow level, um, milk yield has a very strong relationship with greenhouse gas intensity. Um, at the farm level, the relationship, if you look at R squared, is, is less than 0.5. It's not terribly high. Why is that? One aspect is to do with herd structure. So particularly at the higher end of, this, of the productivity scale, you have farmers who tend to really, they're perhaps more commercially oriented, they keep as many lactating cows in the herd as they can, and they don't raise a lot of follower animals. Whereas at the other end, um, which is typically, let's say, more subsistence oriented, you have people that have cows, some of which are lactating, uh, they have heifers, they may even be raising male animals as well, because livestock are important for many different things, not just for milk production. So herd structure is one of the factors that um, makes a big difference. Um, when we analyze the, the reasons for this, the, the other really uh, dominating factor that, that came out is uh, the feed, the, the use of feed concentrate is a really key factor in, in, in intensive regions in Kenya. Um, farmers tend to feed uh, a standard amount of say two kilograms of feed concentrate dairy meal per cow per day. But they tend to do it without regard for the lactation cycle. So when the cow actually needs more nutrition, they're still feeding two kilograms per day. Um, and so one of the explanatory, other important explanatory variables was um, uh, concentrate feeding. Because for every kilogram you feed, there's a, there's a, a fixed kind of greenhouse gas emission cost the fixed carbon footprint of producing that dairy mill. But um, in the Kenya case, it's not used very efficiently. So we, that's, they're the sort of two factors, herd structure and, and uh, feed concentrate use that we came up as, as the big um, explanation for variation around, around the curve. Uh, thank you so much, Andreas. And uh, one question, actually uh, more than one question on the survey method. So I'm also trying to compile in two questions from Titis and, and Durba. So can you comment a little bit more on the, the survey uh, to estimate live weight uh, and milk yield in Kenya? And on top of that, it's uh, given that it's based on uh, interviews with farmers, how to ensure uh, this is accurate and consistency? inconsistent? Um, yeah, so <clears throat> the when, for example, when we did the research that um, led to this, uh, this, this curve that I'm showing here, um, we did a survey, it was a farmer questionnaire survey. Um, but for the estimation of live weight, we uh, instructed that the enumerator should measure the heart girth of one animal of each subcategory per farm. So if a farm only had a cow, then they should measure that cow. If they had, say, a cow and two heifers, they should measure the cow and one of the heifers. Um, and that was kind of a trade-off. Like The households were selected randomly um, and as far as possible, the, the animals in the herd were selected randomly, but to be honest, they were probably selected through convenience, which animal was actually in the store at the time. Um, it's kind of the uh, practical approach to balancing sort of random sampling and, and 
sort of what's cost effective and, and feasible at, at, at the time. Um, the other interesting thing is that the allometric equation used to convert half curve measurements to an estimate of um, live weight. There are different published equations out there um, and uh, they have different accuracies uh, for different um, target, target groups. So, so that's another thing to look into. Um, it ha there's also some publications that have compared farmer estimates of live weight with measurements and basically farmer estimates of live weight are not sufficiently accurate. Um, whereas heart girth measurements, I think they typically have an error of plus or minus 15%, which is, yeah, it's, a, it's sufficient. Milk yield, it has the same challenges. Um, to do a large scale survey, you, you can't really go around measuring. You have to, you have to rely on farmer self report. Um, but we also know that it's, it's also quite inaccurate because of things like farmer recall or farmer's own ability to estimate, um, but also because lactation, uh, yields change throughout the lactation cycle. Um, in our case, we relied on a, a one-off survey. Some of the literature that we drew upon was not using one-off surveys, it was using um, multiple measurements through the lactation cycle. So you could say it was better quality data than um, the data we had from our own survey. There are trade-offs in these uh, different different methods. Uh, great, Andreas, uh, thanks. And uh, one more on digestibility and, and methane emissions. So uh, how do you include or could be included uh, the, the effect of different pasture species influencing. How do you include different pasture species influence in methane emissions at national level? How could it be done? So coming back to this example from Ethiopia, what the statistics agency does is it collects data on the feed, the diet composition, yeah, six diet categories. And then we use the scientific literature to estimate the digestibility of uh, each of the components within these uh, categories. So taking this example of, of grazing, uh, grazed fodder, um, we looked at the existing literature on the metabolizable energy of uh, pasture in different seasons and different locations in uh, Ethiopia and then came up with uh, an, an average estimate for the country. So in this case, if the quality of the measurements, the representativeness of the measurements or the completeness, so the coverage of the measurements, if they increase through more and more scientific literature or through a large scale representative survey, then you know, the, the, the estimate of feed digestibility from pasture at the national level, this, this improves over, over time. What we also have in, in this case is data from the Central Statistics Agency it can tell us how is use of pasture changing over time. So actually what we found is the proportion of diet from coming from grazing has been decreasing over time in the official data set. And so as the structure of the diet, so the, the percentage attributed to each of these six diet components, as this changes over time, then the estimate in the inventory of feed digestibility, this also changes over time. Yeah? So if you have a data source that is able to tell you what is diet composition, if you have data sources that can tell you what are the chemical composition and the digestibility of the different components of the diet, and if this data set is consistent over time, then basically you have a feed digestibility estimate that um, changes 
as you calculate the emission factor. And, and so you can account for this kind of um, effect that you're referring to. I hope that's what you were re referring to. If not, um, please ask again or, or, or note something in the chat box. Thanks, Andreas. And one more question. That's a very interesting one. So how can uh, data generated from research contribute to national uh, inventories? So I also would like to put on top of that, like how can the academia or even the students with their research can interact with government bodies to improve their respective country, country's inventories? What is your recommendation for interaction? Um, it, it varies between countries. So as I mentioned at the moment, um, there's only something 20, 20 something countries that are using the tier two approach. So those countries that are not using it and you know, they're using tier one and at the moment they're happy staying with tier one, they probably don't have a lot of use for research. Um, the research becomes incredibly useful when a country has decided it wants to adopt a tier two approach. So um, that varies. I mean, the, the key thing is that the ministry, the relevant ministry has to have its institutional arrangements. So how does it collect data? Does it do it by hiring a consultant or does it do it by delegating your national research institute or does it have like an advisory uh, group such as we set up in, in, in Kenya and, and Ethiopia? Um, so that really depends. And, and if you want to find out, the best thing to do is just get in touch with the person in charge of your national inventory for the agriculture sector and, and ask, um, you know, how do they access data? Um, if a country has an ongoing process, um, often they do things like they have like a, an annual review of, or a biannual, or every few years they have a, a, an official review of publications. Um, Others, it's a bit less systematic. So again, speak to the people involved in the inventory. They may be, for example, working with a national expert, and it's largely the national expert who needs to know what publications are there. He will then, he or she will then uh, analyze that data and interpret it for the ministry. So it, the thing is, work out who's involved, who's doing what, who has what roles, and speak to them. Find out where is the entry point to get your, uh, your data or your publication, um, uh, get it into the, into the process. Okay, thanks Andrea. So uh, let's make uh, one more question before we wrap up. Uh, so going back to the uncertainties um, analysis, right? Uh, so how to deal with uncertainties uh, of uh, cattle uh, data one, one, when we, you have only one source of uh, data. For example, I guess like if we are getting our activity data from uh, national census, for example, how to, is, is there a way to estimate an uncertainty around a single source of uh, activity data? Yeah. Um, yes, there is. So if the data comes from a sample survey, such as uh, is used by most statistics agencies. They generally provide the estimate of the total population together with an estimate of the standard error. So, uh, and the standard error, you, you can then use that to estimate margins of error around, you know, it's, um, around that, that mean estimate. So for statistical sample surveys, they typically have that um, uh, standard error. And if they don't, then uh, it can either be calculated or there's something wrong with the way the data is the, the, the way the data is done. For official estimates coming from the ministry, if they come through administrative data, they don't come with an estimate of the standard error. It's just you know the total that is reported by the officials. And so what we did in the Kenya case, um, what happens is the administration estimates the number of total number of cattle every year. And then every 10 years, there is a census. And what we did is we looked at the last time the census happened, 
and they had to adjust the administrative data in view of the census. How big was the adjustment? So in 2009 in Kenya, they did a, a full census that is like much more reliable, the administrative data, and as a result, they adjusted the official ministry's estimate by something like 1.3%. And so in the inventory, we estimated um, an uncertainty range, a margin of error of plus, plus or minus 2% or something like that. Um, if you don't have such an estimate for a particular country, you can look at other countries' examples where they have estimated uh, the uncertainty of, um, of their population data. And that, you know, some inventories do that. They say, we don't know, but we looked at the inventory from Bulgaria and the inventory from Belgium, and they reckon that their uncertainty is plus or minus 5%, and our country is similar to them, so we think the same. Um, so that, that's kind of a, a very second best option, um, but it is also done in the inventory context. Okay, uh, thanks, Andrew. So I think the similar mindset can be used to improve inventories, right? Looking at what uh, uh, countries with similar farming system uh, is doing for improving, and then you can replicate it in your own country, right? So I think it, it replies more or less, answer more or less the, the question we had uh, last minute. So uh, yeah, it's been very nice to, to talking to you, uh, uh, Andres, but uh, we need to wrap up. And uh, I would like again to thank you very much uh, to, to like taking the time to talk to us. It's always a pleasure to, to hear from you. And uh, I would like to uh, thank all the participants for this third special session of the 2020 Cliff Grad uh, webinar series on livestock MRV. So again, thank you so much all. Have a great, a great day, a great week. And we see each other soon. Thank you all. Thanks so much, Andreas. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.